first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to be able to travel around the world and see that uh, even though we're separated by great geographical distances, uh, we still all can get together with our appreciation of uh, Python programming language. So this is a talk about CPython governance. Uh, and because CPython is the reference implementation of Python, uh, that is the, the implementation where all new features are first added uh, and where language design happens, uh, this is also a talk about the governance of the Python programming language. Uh, so this became a very interesting topic uh, to people recently in the last year or so uh, because there was a dramatic shift. Uh, maybe probably you heard uh, Guido step down as the benevolent dictator for life. So I'm going to talk about that uh, and the changes that that brought to the project. But I also want to make sure to prevent, present a, a holistic picture of how CPython governance has evolved over the last decades. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Python project. Uh, what the current state is, and, and even tender a few speculations about what the future might hold for, for governance with CPython and, and the future of the language. So but before I dive into that, uh, Guido says hello. Uh, so uh, he, he likes to hear about uh, far-flung uh, Python conferences and is happy to hold signs. Uh, and a little bit about me. So. I've been a CPython core developer for 11 years since last Wednesday. Um, and I've worked on all over the language uh, in the standard library uh, and broken most of it. Uh, I'm not really a implementer of very big fancy features. I prefer to do things like make sure that the interpreter doesn't seg fault. Uh, I, like probably the most fancy thing I ever implemented was the uh, multiplication operator, so the at sign, the matrix multiplication operator. I implemented that. Um, and I've also worked on various parts of the CPython project, which are not the language themselves, like documentation uh, and, and project infrastructure. Uh, outside of CPython directly, uh, I wrote the SIX library. Uh, which is a Python 2 and 3 compatibility library, uh, which is pretty widely used. Uh, if you don't have it as at least a transitive dependency, you're probably in a really happy world where you're only using Python 3, right? Um, and it turns out that uh, all that open source stuff doesn't really pay the bills, so I, my day job is working at Dropbox on, on developer tools, which includes the, the use of Python at Dropbox. So let's dive into the, the topic of this talk, uh, starting with a little bit of the history of Python programming language. Uh, so I said I've been a core developer for 11 years. Uh, that feels like a very long time to me. Uh, but in terms of a Python scale, it's not really all that long. Uh, Python is a very old project at this point. Uh, Guido says that he came up with a first idea for it uh, in December of 1989. And at the time, uh, he was working at a Dutch research institute called Centrum Viskunde en Informatica, uh, or CWI as an acronym. And if you go and look at CWI's website on their about page, they'll see they'll, like the first paragraph is how proud they are that the Python programming language was invented there, which is a little funny because uh, Guido was not supposed to be inventing a programming language when he was working at CWI. Uh, he was supposed to be working on an experimental operating system project called Amoeba. And uh, Amoeba was a very ambitious project. Uh, it was like microkernels, you know, it was going to solve all the terrible uh, operating system problems. Uh, so, and Python was initially used uh, within the Amoeba project at CWI uh, to automate uh, tasks, just like we use Python, Python today. Um, so Amoeba obviously did not do so well, uh, but Python turned out to be pretty popular. And uh, so Guido publicly released it uh, to the world at large in 1991 uh, by publishing a tar tarball, which had been segmented into 21 different pieces, uh, and sending it to a mailing list, which is what you did in those days. 
Uh, and so, remember, this is a very long time ago. So this is like five years even before the term open source had been invented. I was very early in the days of, of uh, public collaboration on on software. And so Python proved to be pretty popular outside of CWDOI too. Uh, and because of the popularity of the language, uh, Guido was invited to uh, join a place called CNRI in the United States in Virginia in 1995. So he moved to the United States. Uh, and there, in, he and a few other core developers worked on, on Python. Eventually, uh, they moved on from C and DRI to a bunch of short-lived uh, uh, startups. Um, so this was 2000s, the dot-com boom. Uh, these include beopen.com and the Zope Corporation. Uh, so the Zope Corporation was, of course, the, the developers of the Zope web framework, which is still with us, but was sort of considered to be Python's killer app at the time. And so it was a very, it was a very optimistic time. Uh, everyone, everyone thought you could um, make a company out of anything, uh, but that didn't actually work out so well. So uh, these companies were, were very short-lived, and sort of by the end of 2001, most of the core developers had, had dispersed uh, across other companies. Uh, one thing which I found very interesting about uh, the history of Python uh, or in its first 10 years was even in the early history, people were really worried about what would happen if Guido went away. Uh, so there's this mailing list um, sent, um, uh, thread. Uh, unfortunately, the bottom of this slide is cut off, but most of the quote is there, uh, which is about um, the title was, if it was Guido was hit by a bus, uh, and here the author uh, says they were meeting with some, some uh, business people who were interested in using Python, uh, but they didn't want to use it because they were worried that uh, Python would go away if, if Guido was hit by a bus or just lost interest in uh, a less violent manner. And they were also worried uh, that Python couldn't be used in business because it didn't have a uh, international standard. So uh, this email said, maybe we need to go to the ISO and write up a standard uh, for, for Python, like there is for, for C++ or, or Java. So uh, it turns out the author of this email probably didn't need to worry because uh, Guido stuck around for a, another 20 years. And uh, Python flourished uh, even in businesses without having a backing standard. But it's uh, very interesting to see that people were, were, were worrying about this even in the early history of, of Python. Uh, and if you want to know more about uh, Python's early history, I recommend uh, this blog, python-history.blogspot.com. And this has a bunch of blog posts about Guido, about the early uh, years of the language, uh, including fundamental language designs, but also some of this, this social I history. There's a lot more to learn. Uh, around 2000, uh, we got sort of one of the main features of Python governance that we know today, which is the Python Enhancement Proposal, or PEP. And a PEP is an explanation of a major feature uh, or policy change in the Python language or the CPython project. Uh, so a good PEP is supposed to pro uh, provide a rationale for why a change should be made, uh, a good specification for that change, uh, and also an exploration of different possibilities that could also solve the problem that the, the PEP is, is solving, uh, but uh, why those should be rejected in favor of the PEP. And so uh, once a PEP is written, traditionally it's been uh, subject to review and acceptance or rejection by Guido as the benevolent dictator for life. Um, but more recently, we've also had something called a BDFL delegate. And a BDFL delegate uh, is someone who is chosen by Guido uh, and is given delegated authority to accept or reject a particular PEP. And this has been used historically uh, for uh, areas which is Guido is not uh, quite as experienced in or uh, where someone else has clear expertise or, or more ownership of an area where they should be making the decision. Uh, so probably the most prominent example is uh, packaging PEPs. So PEPs related to packaging, disk utils, setup tools, and so forth, PIP, 
uh, are all delegated away from, from Guido. Uh, and the PEP has been a really uh, successful innovation in governance. So in the last 19 years or so that PEPs have existed, there have been almost 500 written. Uh, and even besides Python, uh, a lot of open source communities, uh, other programming languages and so forth, have something which is, even if it's not called blank enhancement proposals, uh, is quite like the, the PEP process. So uh, that uh, takes us up to today, uh, where, uh, where we see Python today. Uh, so there's no doubt that Python is a major programming language today. Uh, if the Tyobi index, which tries to track the, the growth and popularity of programming languages by looking at the search terms that people are entering into, into search engines, uh, once again gave Python its Language of the Year award in 2018, uh, which means that it's the language that saw the most, most growth in 2018. Uh, but so that's kind of a, a synthetic metric of language popularity, which when, doesn't tell the whole story. But what we also know is that Python is used in basically every domain of computing that you can imagine somewhere. Uh, so pretty much any company of any size now has some Python uh, somewhere. And Python is used in everything from agriculture to uh, machine learning to education uh, to just gluing together uh, shell scripts. And for being such a uh, major language, I think Python is pretty unique in that uh, CPython is a completely um, volunteer-driven project. Uh, so there are a few core developers, uh, including Guido, who get uh, a little segment of their work time from their employers to just work on CPython. Uh, but there are no uh, people, to my knowledge, who are paid uh, full time to work on CPython. And this is a, a pretty different situation than uh, many other languages uh, at the top of the popularity list, like uh, C++ or Java or JavaScript, uh, which all have uh, really big corporations behind them. So that's kind of the, the current state of the world uh, and how everything was working until this guy came along. Uh, so this. This is what's affectionately known as the walrus operator. Uh, and the walrus operator is proposed in PEP 572, assignment expressions. So the walrus operator is a new way of assigning a value to a variable. And the key thing about this, how this is different from normal equals is that you can do it within an expression. So Python traditionally has had a very strict separation between statements and expressions. And you haven't been able to assign variables in expressions. Uh, and PEPS 572 uh, came along to, to change that. Uh, so I think by looking at a few examples in the PEP, we can see what, this, what they were trying to accomplish uh, by introducing the walrus operator. So, here you have uh, the before and after. So uh, we're trying to uh, find this environmental variable called Python user base. Uh, and if, and if, it, if it's set, uh, return early from the function. Uh, so in the original code, uh, you have to assign the, the end base variable uh, before you can actually check that it exists uh, and then return it. Uh, but under PEP 572 with assignment expressions, uh, you can assign the end base variable uh, and do the check for, for um, truthiness in the same line. So here, uh, you, you end up saving uh, one line of code, uh, which is perhaps not the most dramatic improvement. Uh, where things get a little better uh, is when you are able to replace really long uh, nested elf, else, f, if else chains. Uh, so here, we're trying to uh, find a function called the reductor uh, and then call it. And, each, and depending on where you find it, you have to call it with, with a different set of arguments. Uh, and this code is currently implemented using uh, the sort of nested code you see on the left. So uh, each time we've, we have a fallback, we have to enter another uh, nested elf is chain. And so by the time you get to the bottom with like the error case, you see the, the code even has to be wrapped because it's, it's hitting the line length, even though the line isn't. Um, particularly long. Uh, and things look quite a lot better under uh, PEP 572 on the right-hand side, uh, where uh, you can check uh, for each of the cases of uh, where the reductor function might be located. Uh, within the uh, condition statements, 
um, and then just immediately call it. So the code is quite a bit shorter and it's less nested. So that's quite, uh, quite an improvement, I think. Uh, so how many of you think that uh, PEP 572 is a good idea? Okay, a few people. Probably not, probably not half though. Uh, so this was super controversial, uh, partially just because it's syntax, uh, and people feel very, very strongly about syntax, and uh, also because it changes sort of a very long-standing uh, behavior in in Python's uh, or Python's model, I guess. Uh, so people felt very strongly about this, um, and it probably would have not. This pet probably would have gone nowhere uh, if Guido Van Rossum and Tim Peters uh, did not sign on as co-authors of it. Uh, so Guido, of course, is Guido, uh, and Tim Peters is the author of the Zen of Python. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, formidable uh, force. Uh, in favor of this PEP. Um, that did not stop people from uh, trying to to object to it, uh, and sort of the result was on our our project forums, our mailing list, uh, particularly Python Dev, and another mailing list called Python Ideas, there was massive sprawling discussions. There was thousands and thousands of messages. There was multiple uh, postings of different pieces of feedback. Uh, and it got to the point where no one person could really uh, read the entire discussion and understand what was going on. And because of that, uh, the same thing was being posted over and over again. Uh, even the PEP author set, uh, said at one point, we have to declare bankruptcy. Uh, we cannot see what is going on here. Uh, so that discussion got very, very unproductive. Uh, and even besides that, uh, social media was sort of doing its job of uh, bringing the worst out of humanity, and, and people are making very uh, invidious uh, and unkind comments about the PEP and its authors uh, on things like Twitter. And so uh, it all turned into a very, very messy, messy situation. And sort of the culmination of all this uh, was on June 10th, 2018, uh, Guido sent an email to Python Dev uh, saying, I'm taking a permanent vacation uh, from being the BDFL, uh, so you all have to figure out uh, what your new governance model is going to be. Uh, so I think for many of us uh, who have known Guido for a while, this wasn't a completely unexpected move. Uh, I remember going to a talk at PyCon 2008 uh, where Guido said, I'm going to resign in five years. Uh, so he actually didn't resign for another 11 years, but uh, I know he's been thinking about it for a very long time. Uh, and so he didn't quit just because of PEP 572, but I think it was a culmination of uh, a lot of stress which he's been feeling about being on the critical, the critical decision path for uh, what is now a global, global phenomenon, Python. And so the Python community uh, really noticed this. Uh, even the, the software engineering community at large um, took note of Guido stepping down because Python's governance model has been around for such a long time and is, and is rather famous. Uh, even the popular media was taking, taking note. Uh, so my parents called me and said, what happened to Guido? Uh, they're not programmers. Um, and e my favorite article was this one in uh, the English news magazine called The Economist. Uh, and The Economist is, very, is known for their very snarky style. Uh, so they wrote an article about Guido stepping down, and they said, Guido wasn't the messiah, but he was a very clever boy. Uh, so this is about as nice as The Economist is to anyone. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a win. Uh, but, the fur but the thing is, uh, the sky did not fall in the Python world right, when Guido stepped down. So uh, people's Python programs continued to execute. Uh, we st even in the C Python project, uh, we continue to fix bugs. We continue to make releases. Um, so Guido's, uh, a lot of uh, the things that Guido used to do in like 20 years ago, make releases and so forth, uh, had been taken up by other people and, and Python at large continued to function. Really the main thing uh, that needed to be resolved was uh, how do we make decisions uh, in C Python uh, and who is kind of going to be setting the vision for the language. And uh, Guido kind of f threw down the gauntlet for us. He said, uh, I'm not going to tell you what your new governance model is going to be. You are going to have to figure it out. 
Uh, and being C Python developers, what we did is we wrote a bunch of peps uh, and then decided on one which would be our future uh, governance model. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a tour of all of the, the governance peps that were proposed so you can get an idea of what we were thinking about when we were doing this. Uh, so the first one uh, is PEP 8002. So we made a whole new PEP namespace in the 8000s for PEPs. This was the Open Source Governance Survey. Uh, and this wasn't even a proposal for a new governance model. Uh, this was sort of an enumeration of all sorts of governance models, uh, mostly in open source projects, uh, but uh, also from companies. So there's an explanation of how Microsoft makes decisions in there, for example. And what we were interested in knowing is uh, how does leadership work in those projects? How do they resolve controversial decisions? That was a very important one uh, because the PEP 572 discussions were all in the back of our minds and we wanted to know if there were more scalable ways of hand handling those kinds of decisions. Uh, so this was just all background information for, for people who uh, to understand uh, pre-existing models of open source governance. Uh, the first actual proposal is one called 8010, the Technical Leader Governance Model. Uh, and the main figure in PEP 810 uh, is someone called the Gracious Umpire Influencing Decisions Officer, uh, which all sounds like word salad until you look at the acronym, which is GUIDO. Uh, and so from this you can probably tell that the GUIDO is supposed to be a replacement BDFL. Uh, and the way it would work under F8010 uh, is that the Guido would uh, sort of have absolute authority over uh, accepting and rejecting PEPs, uh, but they would be elected uh, for five-year terms. Uh, and then there would also be an advisory council uh, which would help the Guido with certain difficult uh, decisions. Uh, so this is this was kind of the most uh, nostalgic um, governance proposal, uh, the one which was about keeping things the same uh, close to the same as they were as possible. Uh, then we have PEP 8011, the trio of Pythonistas. Uh, so this is actually a little bit like the, the technical leader governance model, uh, except rather than one person, there were three people. Uh, and so the core developers would elect a group of three people who would have absolute uh, authority over the, the project. Um, and sort of the idea is rather than uh, electing three separate people, you would be electing groups of three people who you thought uh, would complement each other's uh, um, strengths and weaknesses in decision making. Then there's PEP 8012, the community governance model. Uh, so this one was modeled off over on what uh, the Rust language community does. Uh, and the basic idea is that uh, different technical areas would be owned by uh, self-selected working groups. And those self-selected working groups uh, would educate, accept or reject the um, PEPs which were happening in those areas. Uh, then there was PEP 8013. Uh, this is a pretty uh, interesting model, the external council model. Uh, in this case, there would be a steering council, which is elected by the core developers uh, who are responsible for uh, accepting and rejecting PEPs. Uh, but the key thing about this, the external part, is that uh, the council members could not be core developers of CPython. Uh, so they would have to be people external to the project. And sort of the idea behind this was that uh, because these people were not intimately familiar with how uh, the Python language is developed, how it works, uh, proposals which were made to them would have to be sufficiently detailed and convincing uh, that even people uh, who weren't part of the CPython project could be sufficiently convinced of their, their value. Uh, then we have PEP 8014, the Commons Governance Model. Uh, so this was also called the, the Anarchy Model. Uh, and the reason is that uh, anyone who wants to uh, could vote on any PEP. Uh, and then there would also be a council of elders elected by the core developers uh, who would not have any actual authority to accept or reject PEPs, uh, but would be responsible for making sure that elections uh, when votes on PEPs uh, were fair. So this PEP is also interesting because it's written by a person named Jak Janssen, uh, who is Guido's office mate at CWI. Uh, so it gives you another sense of that there's people who've been within the project for, for 30 years at this point. PEP 8015, uh, this is a lot like the, the community model uh, in that there's Python teams uh, who own specific areas uh, and the PEPs 
within them. And then there's also a steering council, uh, which is responsible for uh, forming teams, uh, disbanding them, and handling uh, issues which don't fit within one particular area. Uh, and then there was PEP 8016, uh, the steering council model. Uh, so I will be discussing that one more in a second. Uh, but once we had all these, once we had all these proposals, uh, we had to decide on one. And the way you do that, of course, is voting. Uh, but that itself is a great meta discussion. Uh, it turns out programmers really, 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 really like talking about voting methods. Uh, and the reason for that is that you can prove that there's no one perfect voting method. Uh, and so that means that everyone can choose their own favorite voting method, ranked choice or, or plurality or whatever, uh, and then argue that its strengths and weaknesses are better than the, like, the other guys. Uh, so we had a fantastic meta discussion. We had like many long threads about uh, different voting methods. Uh, but we did finally decide on a voting method. Uh, and th we did finally vote. Uh, and the winner was the steering council, PEP 8016. Uh, and because it won, it got uh, put in the place of honor at PEP 13 for good luck. And so a few details about the steering council. Uh, so this was considered to be the boring governance model. That's good, boring governance. Uh, it's uh, very close to what the Django project does. And the basic uh, layout of authority is that there's uh, five members uh, who are nominated and elected by core developers. And the committee, the council, serves for a single feature release. Uh, so uh, in the Python world, that's incrementing the second number of the version. Uh, for example, 3.7 to 3.8 is a feature release. Under our current release schedule, that's about every 18 months. Uh, and in order to... Uh, prevent one company from or organization from taking too much power in the project, uh, there's a rule that no three members of the steering council, uh, so not a plurality, um, can be from the same company. Uh, and the steering council is sort of given ultimate authority. Uh, they can uh, accept or reject pus, add or remove core developers, and so forth. Uh, but the PEP encourages them to use these powers the least amount possible. Instead, steering council members are supposed to uh, achieve a decision-making pro process uh, through, uh, through things like community um, discussion uh, and, and trying to build consensus. Uh, so that's our, our new model. And of course, we had to elect a steering council. Uh, so we argued about the voting methods to how to elect the steering council first. Uh, and then we'd elected them. And uh, the election had 67 voters. So 67 core developers decided to vote. A uh, very large number of them were also candidates. So there were 17 candidates. Uh, so uh, everyone voted. And then here's our first steering council. Uh, so you'll probably recognize the first name there. Um, so Guido is still very much around. Uh, he's still very active in the project. Uh, he just doesn't want to have uh, all the decision authority vested in him, but he's on the steering council now. Uh, and the rest of these people have also been in the project for a very long time uh, and bring a lot of experience and knowledge and wisdom to the, the position in the steering council. Uh, so uh, thankfully, they did not elect me. I got the sixth number of votes, most number of votes. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's the steering council and our new governance model, uh, which brings me to uh, looking a bit into the future. Uh, so I have a few uh, sort of miscellaneous topics about that. Uh, the first thing is is that there's kind of a, a unresolved problem uh, in Python and frankly, the world at large uh, about how to handle uh, large scale discussions. Uh, so we still don't know uh, what the best way to handle things like PEP 572 assignment expressions is. Um, but uh, one of the things we wanted to try is uh, moving away from mailing lists. Uh, so we thought maybe if we have better moderation tools and so forth, uh, we can make discussions more productive and cut off uh, unproductive ones. Uh, so we've been trying this tool called Discourse. So Discourse is kind of a, a fancy web forum thing. Uh, and all of the uh, core developers have been using it for our sort of internal communications. Um, it replaced a mailing list called Python Committers. Uh, we had all of our governance discussions on Discourse. And it worked, it worked pretty well. Um, 
it has a lot better moderation tools, so um, discussions which are unhelpful can be uh, turned off, and new threads are, it's very easy to split new threads off when discussions fork. Uh, but it's still not clear that it solves our discussion problem because we've only been using it for a group of people who number uh, basically less than 100. Uh, so it's, we don't know if it will solve large-scale discussions, but uh, we're looking into to, uh, technological improvements to our discussion technology. Another thing we're looking at changing uh, is uh, moving to using GitHub for our issues. Uh, so for about the last 13 years, Python has been using uh, its own host issue tracker called called Roundup. I think we're probably the only people in the world still using it at this point. Um, and since we've moved our, our, our Git repositories to GitHub, uh, we've also been thinking about moving our GitHub issues or to GitHub issues, uh, which should hopefully help uh, with contributors who are more familiar with the, the GitHub interface. Uh, yeah, so a note or two about Python 3. So um, the world is looking up for Python 3. Uh, so back in the early days of Python 3, 2012, 2013, 2014, and so forth, uh, things sometimes felt a little grim, uh, like it wasn't getting much attraction or adoption. Uh, people weren't porting their libraries and frameworks to Python 3, uh, and, and everyone was just going to stay on, on Python 2. Uh, but things are looking a whole lot better now. Um, basically, any dependency you could possibly want has been ported to Python 3 now. Uh, people are all writing their new projects in Python 3, uh, and the community has definitely uh, moved to, to Python 3, uh, which is good because I'm really, really sick of Python 2. Uh, so one of my jobs is to, to release Python 2.7, and I made Python 2.7.16 like last month, and I'm really, really getting sick of it. Uh, so uh, we're going to stop making Python 2 releases in less than a year. Uh, 2020 is the year that uh, Python 2 dies for uh, upstream. Um, and at that point, we're going to say a fond but very firm farewell uh, to Python 2 and, and, and stop, stop writing it. Um, so I'm not the only person who's tired of Python 2. Uh, one of my favorite websites these days is this one called python3statement.org, which uh, is a list of all dependencies, uh, open source projects, which are going to drop their Python 2 support uh, along with upstream in 2020. Uh, so you are almost surely using a library there. Basically, the entire scientific stack is going to drop uh, Python 2, to support, uh, including um, TensorFlow, uh, NumPy, SciPy, uh, and all sorts of web frameworks. Uh, so uh, the community uh, is, is throwing off Python 2. So that's the open source world's doing very well. Uh, now I know that a lot of companies are sitting on very large uh, Python 2 code bases, legacy code bases. Um, I, I know all about that, um, which would very, very well be Python 2 code bases in five years. Uh, but uh, this makes me confident that in five years, they'll also be large legacy Python 3 code bases. Uh, so success. Um, the last thing about Python 3, though, is that uh, I don't think we want to do that again. Uh, so it was a very good learning lesson for uh, everyone in the C Python project uh, about the value of backward compatibility, uh, about the difficulty of updating every single piece of uh, source code in the world. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there's never going to be a backwards breaking or a bre breaking backward incompatible big release uh, like Python 3, uh, again, at least under the per current people who are uh, in charge of, of Python. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the uh, Python language is now under uh, the, the steering committee, uh, steering council, uh, which should bring up in your mind like scary thoughts of, of design by committee, uh, which, is, which is fair. Uh, committees are, are famous for their conservative decision making or their uh, design by compromise uh, types of thinking, uh, which is uh, usually ends up pre being pretty me mediocre. Uh, for example, I think it's it's very likely that uh, PEP 572 would not have been accepted uh, if the steering council was uh, in place when it was proposed. Um, so Python um, nah. Python uh, may not. 
be uh, have quite the same design decisions anymore. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's less important that the la core language is getting uh, flashy features all the time. Uh, so right now, uh, the killer thing about Python is the great third-party ecosystem. Uh, so people start using Python because uh, they're using Django or because they're using uh, SciPy. Um, or they're using one of the many other frameworks uh, or libraries which people have built. Uh, and so the Python language is a core part of that, uh, but it's not the reason that people start using it. And they may come up to appreciate Python, uh, but the, the most important thing uh, for the language now is, is maintaining the, the flourishing third-party ecosystem. Uh, and I don't think it's, it's quite as important that, that the language evolve very quickly uh, because it, it has most things that people want to do now. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. And any questions? Come on. Uh, okay. Uh, Do you want me to tell you oh, what your my yeah, favorite already. color is? Yeah. <laughs> Hi again, thank you very much for your speech. Um, you said that uh, there were about 500 uh, pips um, right, uh, was were written uh, to this time, and uh, but the numbers are even 8,016, 8,013. Uh, you said about the namespaces uh, which uh, are present in the uh, enhancement proposals. And uh, can you please say about uh, the most common uh, namespaces in uh, PIPs? Thank yes. you very much. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So uh, sort of the, the, the the two digit PEPs are meta PEPs. Uh, so there's a like PEP Pep, PEP 0 is the PEP index. Uh, PEP 1 is uh, the description of the PEP writing process. Uh, and then there's a few other project level uh, policy PEPs in there. So like PEP 13, because it's the governance model, uh, it got a two-digit uh, PEP number. And sort of the normal PEP started about 200, I think. Uh, so those are um, fe language features and so forth. Uh, and But at various p various points, there, there have been people who um, pick special PEP numbers. Uh, so for example, um, PEP 404 is the Python 2.8 unreleased schedule, uh, which is about uh, how we're not going to release Python 2.8. Uh, and there's also a PEP called, there's also PEP 666, uh, which is a great number. Uh, I don't actually remember what it's about. but uh, And then, uh, so a lot of the uh, Python 3 uh, features uh, so, sort of the code name of Python 3 was Python 3000 for a long time. Uh, so, a lot of those PEPs start with uh, 3000, uh, and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't remember why 8000 was picked for the the governance ones, but it's it felt, it, I guess it felt like a a different important category of PEPs. So, someone said, let's give it a new namespace. Thank you. Uh, more questions. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask you about um, uh, how much time do you spend on Python yourself? Uh, and don't you get tired of it? And maybe period periodically you seek some other language to take some features out of it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I it, the amount of time I'm able to spend on, on Python uh, varies a lot. Uh, so I obviously I have a day job programming and sometimes I, I go home after the week's done and say, wow, I just spent a whole week uh, yelling at computers. Maybe I don't need to do that at the weekend too. Um, uh, so probably maybe like th three, four, five hours a week is, is, is average. That's as much that I can, that I can fit in. Um, and in terms of, in terms of uh, Learning from other languages, I think that's I think that's very 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 important. I mean, I personally like to learn new languages, um, and and new new technologies, um, and I it's it's also uh, 
very common in PEPs uh, that we expect people to say how uh, a particular feature shows up in other languages and why that is or isn't a good idea. Um, and so you have, to, you have to be careful when you're doing that because uh, sometimes uh, features which are in other languages fit very well in the model of those languages and if you just directly uh, co copy them into Python, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work with sort of the, the Python the Python uh, philosophy, uh, but it's it's certainly uh, sort of shameless shameless copying uh, is is a very important uh, language design um, uh, principle. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Yeah, over there. I have two. Thanks. Uh, is there any chance? Uh, then uh, PyPy becomes uh, a reference implementation of uh, Python. Ah, uh, PyPy. Okay. Uh, so, um, I've actually worked on PyPy a bit. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's one of the most interesting projects, uh, not only in Python but just the world of software. I think there's there's things in it which uh, I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, it, um, I. The PyPy project is not really so much interested in guiding the evolution of the language, uh, but but is more interested in uh, the the implementation of of Python uh, and and perspective optimizations, of course, um, and so the sort of the traditional C Python and uh, PyPy have kind of always had sort of separate goals I guess as 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 projects so I'm not I'm not really sh I'm not really sure how you would how you would blend sort of the 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 implementation focus of PyPy and 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 the design parts of CPython because for the most part they're they're sort of disjoint disjoint sets of people I mean you should you should definitely use PyPy uh, it's great uh, it should see wider adoption uh, but I I don't. I don't think in the next few years it will become the reference implementation. It's still in Python two. <laughs> uh, well, there is a PyPy three for the three point five Python. Oh, uh, right, but the PyPy itself is is written in oh, in Python. In our Python is Python yeah. two. Yeah. Um, the last question, please. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, man. Um, a while ago, on one of the mailing lists, I've uh, seen a dis like a number of discussions regarding Python four. So my question is, uh, since we're not going to break uh, backwards compatibility, what would be like a pivotal point to increment the uh, major version? Uh, so, yeah, that's a that's a very much an open question. Uh, as far as I'm personally concerned, I think we should just not talk about Python four. Um, <laughs> like we should, you know, we should release like. 3.25 and like just you know like li like Linux kernel style like you know I'm really excited for 3.14 that'll be good Pi um, uh, but I like I mean just just speculating like some things like there's the people want to like redo the C API uh, to make it easier to make things faster because that's that's one of the things which makes it hard to, to optimize C Python is the the C API. Uh, so like maybe if we we majorly broke that or something uh, we could we could move the Python four. I just I don't I don't really know if that's a good idea, uh, but yeah. So I I don't I don't want there to be a Python four right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, one last thing, you should choose the best question, and uh, for the best questions, we're giving. The certificate for the book. You can uh, choose any on uh, at stand of our partners, DMC, uh, DMK Press. Uh, so. Oh, you should have told me that beforehand. <laughs> 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 um, uh, import random. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I th th <laughs> there were no bad questions today. Okay. Uh, okay, we have four questions. Choose any number. Three. Three. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a short break. Of course, if you have more questions, you can chat with uh, uh, Benjamin in the hall.